Realtist Real Talk Podcast. Hello, Realtist. Thank you for joining us today for our Realtist Real Talk Podcast. I am Amber Lewis. And I'm Rob Pasker. And we have the pleasure of having our very own Jim Carr here with us who just got off stage from sharing the Sheba Report. He is the housing, finance, and urban policy expert and our friend here at NARAP. So thank you for being with us, Jim. Yes, sir. Thank you. So you just went through a whirlwind of information. And we were saying before, numbers don't lie. So let me ask you this. What is the importance of statistics when we talk about just black home ownership and the disparities? Oh, it's really important. And I can't overstate it. You know, one of the challenges that we face is that black households have historically not had the same home ownership rate as non-Hispanic whites. And when you when you hear that, you hear people give lots of excuses like whites have higher income or they've worked harder or they save more. But when you look at the data, then you realize all of those reasons just go right out the window as nonsense. Wow. And one of the things that we try and do is we keep it real by going all the way back to the 1930s and even uh, in 2018, we went back to 1920 to show mm -hmm. that, in fact, the gap in home ownership attainment is actually greater now in 2022 than it was in 1920. Wow. And so the question becomes, well, how did that happen? And only by looking at data can you really understand why those gaps exist. And the short story of why those gaps exist is the federal government's role in supporting and promoting white home ownership and not just not supporting black home ownership, but federal laws and regulations actively undermining mm -hmm. black home ownership. And you can see it just looking at the data when the institutions come online, then you start seeing the gap expanding and today if you look at the numbers, you'll see lots of data that show that discrimination still exists in the system. It's just not blatant, but it's built into all of the automated technology and all these things wow. that are supposed to be, you know, colorblind, mm -hmm. but they're not colorblind right. because they're based on historic access to things like banking, um, your historic access to different types of credit. And so if you historically don't have those, then you today, not historically, will be disfavored in the housing finance system. And it just continues along. So it's important every year, NAREP just puts the data out there. It's undeniable. It's been many years you'll hear people saying, ooh, whoa, I can't believe it. Well, believe it because it's an unfair system that's never been fixed. When you talk about things that are more overt in the past, we, we talk specifically about redlining. Mm -hmm. But now when you say covert type of systems that are intrinsic in our, our system, our banking system, our financial institutions, can you give a couple examples of the things that you talked about today? Absolutely. So as an example, we have known for years that the traditional credit scores used by the major financial institutions, federal financial institutions, for years, they're outdated. I've written multiple articles. The Urban Institute has written multiple articles. Many people have written about it. And yet, the federal finance agencies have been studying the possibility of changing them mm -hmm. for more than five, six, seven, eight years. Only this year that they introduced new up uh, new sophisticated, more updated credit scoring models. And even then they've said, but we're going to roll them out slowly. So we've got a whole decade mm -hmm. of people who potentially were denied loans or who were charged more for access to their loans than they needed to be because of outdated scoring systems. And we're still taking baby steps. It's important that they've acknowledged it and introduced more sophisticated models but they're still tiptoeing in the water as if it doesn't matter. And every day they tiptoe, another black household may be paying way too much, you know, one, two, three, four percentage points or more for access to loans that they shouldn't be paying. It's wrong. It's unacceptable. 
And it's quite frankly, it's just it's flabbergasting that it just continues and continues and continues. 100%. So when in doing the report, what were some statistics that, that jumped off the page to you that you think were uh, unique to this 2022 report? <laughs> well, that's hard because you just saw my presentation, yeah. right? So I have so many statistics. I think that some of the things that were really important are is the role that women play, black women play, in terms of home ownership for black America. Um, and it's interesting, it's the exact opposite role that white women play mm -hmm. for home ownership in the white community. Right. The majority of loans in the, the increases in, for loans in the black community were women. Um, and they make that number one tier of the most important contributor. Whereas in the white community, white women, white female applicants applying alone are the number three. So they're they're the bottom, and for blacks, the, women, the females are number one. Um, more whites tend to apply as joint, mm -hmm. which is really important because for either black or white, the opportunity to be approved is greater if you have a co-applicant because just simply you've got more financial resources coming to the table. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that because we have women leading the charge within home ownership increase for blacks, that in fact they should be dis disfavored. In fact, the housing finance system should be you know better refined so that it can take into account the unique challenges faced by women in the mortgage market and meet their needs. You know what I mean? Yes. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was just going to say, I think that's such an interesting statistic, especially when you think about um, wage gaps for mm -hmm. women and the fact that you know black women are kind of catapulting the numbers for us when it comes to black home ownership. Do you think a part of that has to do with the fact that black women are one of the most highly educated segments? Part of that being the fact that they are also higher paid segment within the numbers when we do look at wages itself against other people of color. Mm -hmm. So the report didn't look, didn't drill into why, because the point of the report looks at a, a, a federal database mm -hmm. called HUMDA, mm -hmm. which is the most comprehensive database on multiple issues about home ownership. So what we do with the report, we just report the facts. It just so happens that women tend to leave. And then what we do is look to see how um, uh, females applying without a co-borrower within the black community compared to those white women. Um, so some of the things that you're suggesting mm -hmm. may be the case. It may be that more women are heads of households with children and, mm -hmm. and more of a you know compelling reason mm -hmm. to want to become a homeowner and have a stable house in a school district or things of that nature. We really don't know. But when you asked about interesting statistics, one of them that it's actually kind of worrisome is that since 2015, the share of black males applying by themselves has actually been steadily falling. Mm -hmm. And we can't explain it. You know, we, we, we probably could explain it if we looked at the data. But again, we just look to see this is the trend. So that it's something that really should be examined because uh, just offhand you think, well, maybe they'd be stable, mm -hmm. but not necessarily falling. So we don't know what that's about. It's a lot. I think black men deal with a lot of things that black women don't have to, like namely child support and something that's not accounted. I haven't seen any type of legislation for is child support counts as debt. It counts against the debt to income mm -hmm. ratio yeah. when it comes to mortgage financing. So I know a lot of black men may be intimidated um, in regards to applying for mortgages because of that fact and affordability. So. That may be true, but what, but when you look to see that since 2015 it's on a downhill, the question is, well, was there some major piece of legislation that changed that, changed that mm -hmm. circumstance? If not, you would expect it would be lower, but pretty consistent, right? Because that issue hasn't changed for years. This is true. It's true. It's something to look into. I think we should definitely explore yeah, more of that. Explore some programming to, to see what's going on there because that's it's not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's not good. And so in terms of when you said, you know, what are some of the things that you found in the report, 
One of the things we thought was important to comment on this year is climate change, which is something that just, it, it's almost as if climate change and environmental hazards has nothing to do with the black community, right? But it has everything to do with the black community because the siting of toxic dumps historically mm -hmm. has an association with black neighborhoods or either because they were put there because the neighborhood was black or blacks lived in areas with older factories that they were deteriorating and or that went out of business and they had toxic grounds that weren't properly uh, environmentally remediated. And now that you have um, climate change mm -hmm. and the infrastructure is old, climate change is compounding the damage now. So if you're having these severe storms, a lot of that um, toxic waste can rise, it can flood the, um, the water systems, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et if you look at, for example, we highlight in the report, Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan is still a problem. Um, we've got uh, Jackson, Mississippi, mm -hmm. another water problem, still a problem. Look what happened to Katrina. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the worst, oldest, most dysfunctional, you know, flood prevention mechanisms. And look what happened to that neighborhood relative to the rest of New Orleans, right? And so those aren't alone. Those kinds of situations, and we highlighted it in the report, we gave lots of data. We actually created maps showing the highest areas in the country, black neighborhoods that have the potential to be damaged by, um, by climate change. Wow. And yet what's interesting is we've got over a trillion and a half dollars if you add them together for the largest infrastructure bill since the Highway Act, arguably the largest climate bill ever, and yet none of them with explicit directives to ameliorate the environmental and infrastructure damage in older black neighborhoods, right? So there's language in there that talks about environmental justice and mm -hmm. people of color and we need to do this, we need to do that, but where is the, you've got $500 billion to replace water and sewer systems and remediate unremediated toxic waste dumps. Where is that part? Not in the bill. So this is very important for the black community, particularly because other things we talk about would have to get passed. This is already passed. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just that it hasn't been passed out yet. So we need to be in that line and we need to be making our voices known because the black community is very powerful in voting. And it doesn't make sense that we have this powerful vote and then we don't get anything for it year after year after year after year. So let me ask you this. So when you when you present a problem that big, a, a lot of people have a choice. It's like they either can do something about it, or if they feel it's too big, then they just kind of live with it. So like with that being said, what can realtors do at the that's on the ground, ground level? What can they do to help move this ticker in regards to policy? Oh, that's a really good question. And I think what they can do is, you know, one of the things that's really great about social media is that you can use social media now to drive protest. And one of the things I think the realtors should be doing is driving protest about how black neighborhoods are just systematically left behind, right? Mm -hmm. People come to office, they leave office. And what do we get? We get a lot of bells and whistles and a lot of nice speeches and not a lot of nice accolades. And, but we don't see politicians until it's time for election. Mm -hmm. Then they all show up, and then when the election is over, they say thank you, and they disappear. The realtors are a very well-organized um, group of professionals who are very smart, very savvy. They know the black community. They know the statistics, and I think they should be taking a much more activist role to really get the federal regulators to purge the systemic discrimination that exists in the system, like I mentioned to you earlier in my presentation about charging people more based on how financially vulnerable they are, which is, which is federal policy upside down. You, you've got federal agencies, and if you are financially marginal, you pay more for credit than if you're wealthy, can pay high down payments, and you're buying very expensive homes, you pay less. Why, how is that a federal priority? A priority 
It's not. The realtors, I think, really need to hammer this home because the systemic discrimination is something that's been talked about a lot. Since George, George Floyd, you know, a lot of non-Hispanic white people finally began to understand, oh yeah, there is some kind of institutional racism, institutional discrimination in the system. I don't think that's all gone. I just think that we just haven't been good enough at really getting back in that groove and focusing on real things as opposed to, you know, sort of settling for nice accolades, compliments, and pats on the back. You know what I mean? Because none of that stuff is going to change anything. Absolutely. And get vocal, realtors. Yeah. <laughs> Turn I, up. <laughs> I think one thing that you said is really important that the realtors can specifically do is to be able to tell the story. Because stories yes, sell, can. right? And so mm. what we know is there is a very high cost at being black. A very high cost. And when you think about food deserts, that you have in your community. You think about the deterioration of our infrastructure. That means that the cost of living is going to be higher. Even when we had COVID and our kids had to be at home, we know we didn't have the fiber optic system that we needed that the others did to be able to have them exactly. work from home and be successful. And so now they're grades behind, years behind right. others. So, you know, I think uh, Rob said on a podcast the other day, which was really good, you know, when they get the cold, we get the flu. And it's so true mm -hmm. because the cost of being black is so high. And so I would just call out to our realtors members, exactly what you're saying, be able to tell the story because that's what's so important. And it just adds up over time. And that's what we take to policy. Mm -hmm. Those are the examples. Those are the voices. And just not to be afraid to be a change champion and be courageous with the voice that you're given. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. One of the thing about the realtors is when you say that, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's even more powerful mm -hmm. than the way you say it because so many of them, you know, they're steeped in the history mm -hmm. because they've been in it. You know, mm -hmm. they are in those neighborhoods 24-7 yeah. and they get it. They've seen the change that's happened over the last five years, ten years. You know, I was laughing about Chocolate City is no longer chocolate, yeah. right? <laughs> and uh, because it fell off the top ten list yes. of largest black populations. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is within that, there's a lot of good change for Washington. Right. But there's also a lot of bad change for Washington where people were forced out of their homes because there wasn't a housing finance system that would have enabled them to renovate those homes at an affordable price and remained in their own neighborhoods. You know, diversity is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm all for it. But when the only diversity <laughs> is right. you leave, right, yeah. we come in. Oh my God. Right? A lot of people are measuring these things at a point in time and saying, wow, look at that diverse neighborhood today. Right. but not 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. So we need to, that's why I'm saying we need a housing finance system that really does do things like full-blown community reinvestment. We've got the infrastructure dollars, we've got the two federal agencies in conservatorship, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they should be empowered to do full-blown community reinvestment. They wouldn't need any subsidies from the federal government to do it because mortgage finance is very profitable. You know, they, instead they shuttle their money off to deficit reduction, which is a hidden tax on homeowners. It should be being reinvested in neighborhoods to drive down housing prices, to renovate homes, to provide mortgages specifically for single-headed households who have unique credit characteristics but who are nevertheless very much qualified mm -hmm. to, you know, to manage a mortgage. If you can pay a rent, you, right. you, you, on a timely basis, you can pay a mortgage. If the mortgage doesn't have to be as high as you know a non-Hispanic white household rolling with lots of dough, but that doesn't mean that you can't afford a modest price home, right? And those federal institutions should be working to actually make those housing prices lower, driving on down those prices. But by sitting on the sidelines and having nothing to do with the fact that little housing is being created. Mm -hmm. The reason for house price rises is because of a lack of supply. Well, but there's no lack of supply if we were renovating them, mm -hmm. right? It's so. true, very true. I think one thing you said during your time on stage, you talked specifically around recession. 
and that everyone's saying we're going into a recession, but you're saying, hey, it's not necessarily the same as 2008. <laughs> Can you touch on that a little bit for the audience here today? Yeah, so two things. What I was saying is the house price mm -hmm. increase is not the same today yes. as then. Mm -hmm. Then it was predicated on a lot of financial products that were not sustainable, and in fact, many of them were actually designed to trigger defaults. And that would def that would force a person back to the borrowing table, so they'd have to renegotiate their loan, pay origination fees all over again, and there are only so many times you could do that, the house cards finally fell apart. Today, it's just a lack of, uh, of supply is probably the single most important driver. And then on top of that, is that institutional investors are making the supply even worse by them parachuting in mm -hmm. and competing with borrowers. Well, most people can't compete with an institutional buyer because they waive the appraiser, they waive the appraisal. They don't need an appraisal. They're paying cash, so they waive the whole lending process. There are no contingencies, they just buy the home. So you can't compete with them. What I was saying about recession though mm -hmm. was I was saying it may be that we avoid a recession. That would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But where the Fed is going, they've made it clear that if a recession is triggered, well then, a recession is triggered. Economic slowdown is what they're trying to accomplish because they want to bring down inflation. And the way they do that is they raise interest rates which stifles consumer demand mm -hmm. and, and wages mm -hmm. and hiring, which can lead to recession. And out of the last 10, most of them, when they've done this, have resulted in a recession. So hopefully this time will be different. But my point was, if the federal government act actively triggers a recession to fight inflation, it should do what it did in 2020, which is recognizing it was federal policy that created a recession, not Adam Smith's invisible hand, they should offer stimulus support for people who find themselves unemployed. But it's just patently unfair to make the trade-off between high inflation or a recession as if recession is not catastrophic for millions of households. Mm -hmm. The majority of Americans now report living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. Into a recession, doesn't the, the equation is that I can't fill up my car now and I have to pay more for bread is I may be evicted, lose my home, lose my ability to pay for medical care, have to drop out of school. These are consequential. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. And it, and it's and it, it, it troubles me when I hear, mm -hmm. you know, the economists talk about this federal policy in such a dispassionate way of well, they'll keep going, but it may result in a a recession and you know but we'll have to weather the recession storm yeah. yeah well you may be weathering the recession storm because instead of earning 23 million you just earn 19 million <laughs> but for people who can't pay for food mm -hmm. right or clothes or their rent it's not a minor thing so I think federal policymakers need to be much more sensitive to the trade-offs that are being made and much more proactive to respond to when they create a crisis, mm -hmm. intervene and help the crisis. Because that's why so many people, black and white, did so well during 2020 and into 2021, because the federal government took accountability for its actions that slowed the economy as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're actively driving us into a recession, we need policymakers to actively help those people who can't help themselves. Perfect. 100%. So it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot. A lot so, to unpack, right? So, I mean, you, you've been doing this for, for uh, how many years now? Oh, the Lord has been for <laughs> 40 years. Jeez. So, it, when it comes to predictions, how accurate are predictions? I mean, can you Do you have a crystal ball to say where you see black home ownership going? I, I don't have any crystal ball, yeah. but what I do have is the data. Mm -hmm. And what the data suggests is that, um, is that blacks are doing marginally better than they have over the last couple of years. But, but when you look at the data, there's nothing in that data that suggests we're going to see any sea changes of greater home ownership. Because we still struggle mm -hmm. when you look at the gap between black and white. 
So like when you look at uh, the uh, denial rates, the gap is still really huge. When you look at things like high cost loans, the gap is still really huge. Blacks pay much more for loans than whites. Mm -hmm. When you look at the appraisal industry, you still see consistent lowballing of prices in black neighborhoods. Again, when you look at things like loan level pricing, which is charging people based on if they're financially vulnerable, we charge them more. That isn't going away unless we make it go away. Mm -hmm. So when you look at those kinds of elements, you realize not really a crystal ball, it's just looking at the data. What of this would lead you to believe that home ownership is going to increase materially? And the answer is none of it. It does not going to, it may slowly edge up another percent or percentage mm -hmm. point, but remember, we were at 50% in 2004, and we considered that to be completely unacceptably low with whites at a rate that was around 70%, right? And so now we're back to 45. So we haven't even recovered yeah. since 2004. So talking about going further, mm -hmm. I, I don't see it unless we bring about fundamental change. And that's why I'm saying we really, really do need active engagement. And we need to flex our political muscle because we are powerful in the voting arena. We're powerful. But what we get from the system in return for our political support does not add up. And we need to stop accepting that. 100%. So I'll say real to this, hold your politicians, <laughs> hold your policy makers accountable. Yeah. This Sheba report is gold. Mm -hmm. I know there are chapters across the nation that they, they print it out and they send it to their, their policy makers. They send it to the mayor, they send it to the city council, their, their state representatives and even their national representatives. So stand on these numbers, mm -hmm. stand on this report because it, who else is doing it like this? It's, there's nothing else like this that's this comprehensive that are dealing with black issues. This is this is gold. Yeah, thank asking. you very much. Absolutely, we appreciate yes, all thank the data. You. Somebody's got to do it, man. And you're the guy. <laughs> you're the numbers guy, right? <laughs> we appreciate you. Do you, you have anything else for the people? Um, I just say, you know, it, it's an honor for me to be asked by um, NARAB so many years in a row to do this. I did my first one in 20, 2013, and, uh, you know, we just keep hammering it home and hammering it home. And, um, you know, hopefully someday um, there, there'll be a groundswell mm -hmm. and people will start to respond. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we keep plugging. we'll keep plugging. Yes. We, we do appreciate you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Okay.